I'm escalating once again, and this time object-oriented programming is garbage. And we'll be looking at an example that's about 3,800 significant lines of code. It's this original NES emulator I found on GitHub. It's implemented in Golang. And I picked it partly because it's just interesting to look at a working NES emulator that's relatively short. It's nice and compact for being a working emulator. But I also picked it because it's actually a very moderate example of object-oriented programming gone wrong. It doesn't really commit any absurdities like examples in the last video. And actually on a line-by-line -line basis, the code is quite good. It's just structurally, it's written in what I would call an obligatory object-oriented style. It's written in an OO way for the sake of being OO, not to any real purpose. So credit to the project's author, Michael Fogelman. It's a, it's a cool project. And the code is actually just fine, except for its OO-ness. And I wanted to demonstrate how it would be better in a straight procedural style. Now, I'm not going to give a full account of how the emulator works because actually, honestly, the details I'm sketching on myself because I don't understand the details of the NES hardware. If you want to learn about NES hardware, uh, the good place to start is this uh, nesdev.com site. It's a de developer wiki for the NES hardware. It explains all the components. And I'm just going to give a broad outline. So if you really want to understand the details, I would look at nesdev.com and then look at the two code examples. His original code, which is at github.com slash fogelman slash nes. And then my procedural version, my rewrite, which is at uh, slash Brian Will slash NES. And understand my version is based off this commit from October 6th because there was some kind of bug with the latest version. So I just worked off the version, which I knew actually worked. Also understand that I've only gotten this compiled and working and tested on Mac. Um, it's supposed to work on Windows, but you have to get uh, OpenGL and port audio compiled using MinGW, and I couldn't get port audio to compile for some reason and just couldn't figure it out on Windows. If anyone has figured out how to solve that problem, I'd like to hear how. In any case, here are the headline statistics. His original version of the code, the object-oriented version, is 3,800 significant lines of code, and then my revised procedural code is virtually the same. So there wasn't any real difference there because unlike the examples we saw in the previous video, on a line-by-line -line basis, he wasn't doing anything really terrible. However, whereas he has 26 files, in my version I have just 9 files because, again, he's following an obligatory OO style, which in Go typically means for every core data structure you have, you then have all its methods defined in their own file of code. So it's generally one data structure per file of code, and then all of its methods. It's not the biggest thing in the world, but I do tend to really dislike that style because one thing it means, you know, for some data types you don't have all that much going on, and so you have a, a lot of files with barely anything in them. And I really just hate having to browse a bunch of files where most of them don't have much of anything. Yes, as we'll discuss, there are problems navigating very large files, the files that are thousands of lines long, but I think in general it's a better problem than having to navigate a bunch of little files. A more substantive problem with his original code is that he has 321 functions slash methods. Most of them are actually methods. In my revised code, I got rid of all the methods, I turned them all into functions, and we ended up in the end with 59 functions plus what I would call 54 sub-functions, functions within other functions. Because what I did is whenever possible, if there's a function only used within another function and for whatever reason I couldn't just straight inline the code, then I would just make it a private function to that other function. It would be nested inside. The advantage of that, you look at someone's code base and the surface area is shrunk. So in truth, yeah, we do have here 113 functions in total, but half of them at least we know are confined to being used in just a confined local scope. So if we're trying to find a foothold of where do we start to understand this code, then we only have to consider 59 functions. We don't have to consider these other 54. Lastly, in his code, he had defined three interfaces. An interface in Go is just a definition of a set of methods, very much like it is in Java. For any type, if it implements all the methods, then implicitly it implements that interface. In my code, I got rid of one of the interfaces entirely, and the remaining two I made what I call dummy interfaces, which is an interface with a single method of the same name that takes no arguments and returns nothing. And then you just have a do nothing method for any type that you wish to implement the interface. And this way you can have effectively a, a reference type, you know, because interface values are references in Go. You can have an interface that points to potentially one of multiple different concrete types. So it's really kind of like having just a, a more type safe void pointer because you know void pointer in C can point to anything whereas these interface references, it's constrained what they can point to. So it's a little more safe. And then when you actually use these references, I just have everywhere, I just have a type switch. And then in each case, you handle each specific concrete type. Effectively then with these dummy interfaces, I'm not doing any polymorphism whatsoever, which is normally what you do with interfaces in Go. You have a defined set of methods 
And then for any call to those methods, it's a runtime dispatch based on the actual concrete type. With these dummy interfaces, there's just the one dummy method which you never call. Now a little bit of a tangent, I think there are cases in Go where proper interfaces and their use is actually a good feature. It's handy in cases where you have an external boundary in your code between an API that you're consuming in your own code or say you're creating an API and anyone who consumes your API is an external boundary from their code. And interfaces are useful across these external boundaries because it's a convenient way to define something that is uh, general and flexible in a way that otherwise would be a little awkward. Because alternatively, you could just have, say, an API where the caller passes in some sort of function, and the function can be a closure of any kind of data type. So you can have varying behavior acting on different concrete types defined in the consumer's code that your API knows nothing about. Interfaces, I think, are actually just a, a cleaner, more explicit way of expressing that idea that the, the call of the API is going to be passing in something with behaviors they've defined themselves and the concrete data acted upon could be something which the API knows nothing about. That's when interfaces are a good idea. And you see this in the standard Go library, things like uh, the read interface and the writer interface. You know, so it's, it's a useful notion just within code I control myself. I'm not going to be defining new types that other parts of my code can't know about. So I don't want to put in the effort to trying to find general notions of interfaces if I don't really need it. That's the double-edged sword with interfaces, is that they can be very general, but you don't want that burden of generality when you're writing your own code that you entirely control. Truly general code is something you should leave up to people creating proper APIs, libraries. General code just doesn't arise as the happenstance of ordinary application programming. Truly general solutions take a lot of time and effort, and they're very hard to get right. And you're really just not going to luck in to writing generalized solutions to problems. It just doesn't happen. There's just a very high bar of quality of what it takes for code to be truly general. And that, in fact, is a problem with object-oriented programming. There's this idea that we're somehow going to be creating generalized code as just a, as a happenstance of normally writing code. But I think that's just wrong. It just doesn't really happen. That's the long explanation of why you should generally avoid using proper interfaces in Golang code, unless you're consuming an API or creating an API. Now, here's the actual process I undertook to arrive at my revised version of the code. Uh, I did it in basically this order. I first inlined nearly all of the single call functions and methods. I then removed the interface polymorphism as I just described. I converted all the methods to functions, uh, which basically means just uh, take what was the receiver and make it the first argument. I then simplified the data types because it turned out after inlining all these functions and, and removing the interfaces and converting the methods to functions, it became clear that Many of the core data types had fields they really didn't need, and there were a couple cases of data types existing that didn't need to exist at all. And then lastly, I consolidated and reorganized the files because once I inlined all that code, it turns out that a whole bunch of files had nothing in them. So I'll take these five points in reverse order, more or less. Here first is the file structure I ended up with. In the root directory, we just have one file, main.go, which uh, virtually has nothing in it. It's a very short main function that just uh, parses the command line arguments and then passes the results to this uh, other function defined in the UI package. And so within the root directory, we have these three packages, the NES package, which is where all the emulator logic goes, and the UI package, where we have all the code for creating the window and initializing OpenGL and port audio and initializing GLFW, which this code uses, and, and all that business. Lastly, we have this util package, which is misleadingly named. It's really a test package. It, it's this single standalone binary program, which just loads a ROM and tests it. So actually, it's not part of the main program at all. It's not imported by either main.go or the NES package or the UI package. Looking at the files of NES and UI, first NES, the console.go file is most of the core logic of that package. Uh, but then the CPU instructions file contains the, the core function that executes a, an instruction on the, the emulated CPU. Memory.go contains most of the logic for how addresses are handled and, and so forth in the, in the emulated hardware. And then NES underscore types. This is the thing I typically do with Go code in each package. I want to put all the types in just one file. And I usually call it the same thing as the package underscore types. So that's what I've done here. Also, all the consts are in this file and the init and main, if, if any. There, there's an init in this particular package, I believe. Looking at the UI package, the run.go, that's the core of that package, the core logic. That's where the kickoff function that's called from main.go is. UI underscore types, again, that's where all the types of this package are, plus all the consts and the and init function. I, I, I think there is one as well in this package. 
And lastly, util.go, that's a bunch of miscellaneous little actual utility functions, unlike the util package, which is misleadingly named. But anyway, util.go, I actually didn't touch that file at all, except for changing an import, I believe. If I were writing the project from scratch, there's probably a lot of stuff in there that I wouldn't keep as separate little functions because a number of them are only called in one place. But it's util code, and util code's kind of special. It, you know, it tends to be stuff that is actually really kind of generic in a way, meaning not terribly specific to the logic of this program. You can imagine it being stuff that you would just copy and paste into other programs. I won't vouch for everything in that file being left as it is, but it didn't seem like it was doing much harm, so I didn't really touch it. Now, before looking at the data types, there's this famous quote, which you've probably heard in some form or another. The original version is by Fred Brooks, and is, I, th I think in his book, The Mythical Man Month, and it goes, show me your flowchart and conceal your tables, and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables, and I won't usually need your flowchart. It'll be obvious. This quote is usually given in more modern terms today. We, instead of flowchart, we say code, and instead of tables, we say data. So he's saying essentially that understanding data is actually the key to understanding code, not the code per se. Or rather, if you, if you saw just the code without first understanding the data types, it's really hard to follow what's happening. Assuming this is true, and I think it is, the question then is, well, isn't object-oriented programming a more data-oriented way of programming? Isn't it then an easier way to understand code? I would say no, because as I argued in the first video, what happens in object-oriented code is it tends to introduce a lot of data types that aren't really data types. They don't exist because we actually need this data in your code. We need this reified entity that otherwise could just be code. And so we end up polluting our data with unnecessary stuff, stuff that is you know, kind of mystifying if you try and think of it as just actually being data, because it's not. And then aside from actually introducing types we don't need at all, even within the types we actually do need, you might then confuse things in object-oriented code by introducing fields that don't really need to be there, at least from the perspective of just the data, don't really make sense. They're there for code reasons, for object-oriented reasons. And in fact, as I'll show in the next few slides, this is exactly what happens in Michael Fogelman's original code. Another thing that tends to happen in object-oriented code is that your data tends to get unnecessarily fractured into small, tiny components. Many parts of data that logically go together can get unnecessarily atomized into separate parts. And, and then also you combine that with the propensity for having many, many files, they tend to get scattered throughout your whole code base in a way that can just be very confusing and make the code unnecessarily hard to navigate. Looking now at my data types in the revised version of the code, I'll start with the stuff that makes up the actual emulator. So looking at the bottom right here, first we have this console struct with first a pointer to a CPU, then an APU and a PPU. APU is the audio processing unit and PPU is the picture processing unit. We'll look at those structures in a moment. Uh, but then we also have a pointer to a cartridge, a pointer to controller one and controller two, because of course you can have up to two controllers on the original NES. And this mapper thing determines how addresses get resolved. Some addresses resolve to RAM, but then other addresses resolve to the other components in the system. And this mapper is partly what determines that logic. I'm not really certain why the mapper is here part of the console and not part of the cartridge because in the actual hardware, it's, it's a component of the cartridge. Different cartridges have different mappers. I think it was made directly part of the console as just a more convenient way of accessing it. But if we were really being stringent about modeling the actual hardware, we'd make it part of the cartridge. As you can see above, there is a mapper field in the cartridge, but that's just a byte specifying which type of mapper, because this emulator, the actual NES had many, many mappers, but there were several that were the most common, and I think this emulator only supports, so let's see, there's like five of them that it supports. And that's what this mapper byte designates. We load a cartridge in the code, and then we actually create an actual instance of mapper based upon the type specified in the mapper field of the cartridge. In any case, we'll look at the mapper types in a moment. Uh, so lastly, in the console, we have a RAM field, which is just a slice of bytes. Looking at the cartridge struct, we first have PRG, a slice of bytes, which is just the actual instructions on the cartridge. And CHR, which is actually sort for character, but generally this refers to uh, little tiles of the various sprites and background imagery in the game. There will actually be art and you know, sound data in the PRG, but the CHR, I believe, is special in, in how the PPU accesses it. The SRAM is a little confusingly named. It's not static RAM, it's uh, just plain dynamic RAM, I believe. It requires refresh cycles, um, but it's the save RAM. It's where if you have a cartridge with save states like, uh, I guess, Zelda and a few others, 
That's why some cartridges also have batteries, because this SRAM needs constant power. The mapper field we just discussed, and then this mirror byte specifies a mirroring mode, which refers to how certain address ranges are actually duplicated. So for a portion of the address space, certain ranges of addresses are mirrored with other portions of the address space. They refer to the actual same uh, byte of memory or the same uh, address of some device, like the PP or something. In the top left, we have a controller struct with buttons, which is an array of eight booleans, just indicating whether the eight buttons of the controller are pressed at the moment. Um, index and strobe, don't know what those are. Strobe, I think, has something to do with the turbo button feature, you know, holding down a button and it counts as repeated fast button presses. Index, though, I have no idea. In the CPU struct, we have first a cycles field, which is just the count of the number of cycles that have gone by. Um, that's just always incremented. It's never reset in the course of the game, so, but it is a uint64, so it shouldn't be likely that we ever uh, overflow, unless you run the game for a very, very, very long time. After cycles, we have all the various registers of the CPU, including first the PC, the program counter, and that's a uint16 because it's a 16-bit address space, SP, the SAC pointer, the accumulator, and, and so forth. I won't go through all the details there. Um, and then at the end, we have an interrupt byte, which signals if an interrupt has been flagged and of what type, and then stall in certain scenarios the CPU needs to wait, so you, uh, certain, certain instructions will put into a state where it stalls for some number of cycles. That's the CPU struct, at least in my version of the code, and what's different in the original version is that the CPU has a memory field, an, an anonymous field uh, for the memory type, which was an interface I got rid of, and when you have an anonymous interface type field in Go, it means that you can directly call the methods of that interface on the type you're embedding in directly. Here, the CPU type, we could call the methods of the memory type, and it effectively dispatches them through its embedded memory type. And it's the same as if we call it on CPU.memory in this case. Embedding the memory interface effectively makes CPU an implementer of memory. So it's kind of a weird mechanism in the language to begin with, and then it turned out, oh wait, the concrete type being passed to this field was this other CPU memory struct object, which had just one field. It was a pointer to console. So let me restate that. It was a really weird arrangement. You have this CPU type, which has an embedded memory interface, and the actual concrete type when we actually constructed the CPU is always this CPU memory struct thing, which contains nothing but simply a pointer to console. So it's like a roundabout way of giving the struct a pointer to a console instead of having one just directly. And somehow the implication is that the CPU is a type of memory and that's doubly weird. So already you have a CPU indirectly containing a console and a CPU which is also memory. This is not only a puzzling head scratcher, it's a total failure of real world data modeling. CPUs of course don't contain consoles, consoles contain CPUs. You don't need this weird recursion between them. And of course also CPUs access memory but they themselves aren't actually memory. So this all was very mystifying, but I eventually figured out after inline a bunch of methods, it turned out the real reason for this strange arrangement was simply that uh, in the methods of the CPU, he was dealing with more stuff than just the CPU. It turns out he was also dealing with the console. And rather than having those methods take uh, pointers to console passed in explicitly as arguments, it must have seemed more convenient just to give the CPU a pointer to console field, except for whatever reason he thought it would be neater to have this interface thing intermediating. It's just very perplexing stuff in ways I can barely articulate. And I think this is a very typical anti-pattern within object-oriented programming. Within the methods of a data type, it turns out very often, oh wait, we need to also involve this other object. And so it's very tempting to make that other object a field of the class, even if it doesn't really make sense data-wise. And it also totally blows holes in any notion of encapsulation. You're supposed to be writing the methods that concern just the CPU. They shouldn't be reaching out and messing with everything else, right? What's, what kind of encapsulation do you have if the CPU methods are all messing with the console and everything that's involved in the console, which is basically everything else in this program. And it turns out this same mistake is echoed throughout the rest of Michael's code. In his other data structures, like the PPU here, he had a very similar arrangement. He had this memory field, which was this other struct, a PPU memory struct with just a pointer to console and nothing else in it. And so his PPU recursively was containing a console, even though the console contains a pointer to the very same PPU. 
as far as I can tell, the only reason he did that is because either he's just getting confused thinking in object-oriented terms, or it's just a matter of convenience of wanting to have, within the methods of the PPU, easy access to the console instead of having to explicitly pass in the console. And then in his APU struct, he did a similar thing, but in simpler form, instead of having a memory field holding a APU struct type, which he never had, he just simply had the APU uh, directly containing a pointer to console. Again, I think just for convenience sake, in the methods of his APU, sometimes he needed to access the console, and that's why it was there. And then in one of the components of the APU, the APU is made up of these different parts. There's the DMC, which is delta modulation channel, then you have the a pulse channel, a triangle channel, and no noise channel. Those all get combined together to produce the sound. But in any case, in the DMC, he had a pointer to CPU. So within this one component of the APU, which is a component of the console, where we have this component, which is a CPU. That doesn't make any sense. The APU doesn't contain a CPU. And yet this CPU pointer is there simply really just for convenience. It's there because we've divided everything into these separate classes that are supposed to be self-contained and encapsulated, and yet these objects are effectively reaching into each other and calling each other's methods in a way that totally defeats encapsulation. In any case, I won't really go over the details of the APU or the PPU, except to note that uh, here in the PPU, we have these fields front and back up in the top left here. Uh, they're both pointers to images, RGBA images, and those, as you might expect, are the front and back buffers. I'm not sure if the actual NES hardware has a front and back buffer. I think it may just have one image buffer that it uh, constantly reads from as it writes. Um, but in any case, the emulator at least does have a front and back buffer. So the front buffer is what's always being displayed. And the back is where the PPU is always writing data to. And when you construct a full frame, then we swap the front and back buffers. The INES file header struct is what's used to parse the ROM files. INES is a standard ROM file format, and it's the only one supported by the simulator. I didn't modify the struct in any way. It's the same as the original code. The instruction struct is actually one I added myself, because originally the code had an array of 256 functions, each index of this array corresponding to an opcode, and so you'd look up by opcode the function to run to execute an instruction. I changed the instruction logic so all that same stuff is in a big switch, because I don't think the Go compiler will inline any of these functions, and so having all these dynamic calls I thought might affect performance, and so I wanted to see what would happen if you put it in, all into a big switch where there's no dynamic calls at all. But it turns out in any case, for every instruction, there's an associated uh, mode and size and number of cycles and number of page cycles. Page cycles are the, it's the number of cycles when we cross page boundaries. So that's what all that is. We actually don't need the opcode and name fields in this instruction, really. We could delete them and it wouldn't affect any code. It's just there to make this big long list of instructions easier to read. Lastly, in the emulator code, we have the mappers I was talking about. And mapper is a dummy interface, as I described earlier. We have five actual concrete types called mapper1, mapper2, mapper3, mapper4, and mapper7. Don't ask me what happened to mapper5 and 6. That's just what was in the code, so I went with it. Uh, maybe five and six he didn't get around to implementing. I, I don't know if these are standard names known to NES developers or not. In any case, as you can see, these mappers, they all have different sets of fields, and so it makes sense to make them different types, and yet we need them to all to be the same type. That's why we have the interface, so that we can have a single field of our console struct, and then anytime we access that mapper field in our code, we're just gonna use a type switch, and then in each of the five different cases, handle these five different types. In the original code, the mapper interface had three proper methods called read, write, and step. So what was a read, write, and step method implemented on each one of these types, I replaced that with three type switches, one for where the read logic was, one for where the write logic was, and one for where the step logic was. And aside from freeing us from having to think in terms of abstract interfaces when we don't really have to, I think the advantage of the switch approach is it means that all of the step logic and all of the write logic and all the read logic are contained in one place. They're not spread across five different files for five different mapper types. And it turns out also that, that these uh, polymorphic functions were all just called in one place. So they're code I wanted to inline anyway. And you can't really do that if you go the polymorphism route. Lastly here, in the original code, each one of these mapper types had an embedded pointer to cartridge field. So like the CPU and the APU and the PPU confusingly had a pointer to console field, even though like a console contains a, a CPU, not the other way around. Here we had the mappers containing cartridges, even though really cartridges should contain mappers. 
Again, I think the real reason for this odd arrangement, aside from just general object-oriented confusion, is simply because within the methods of the mappers, it turns out that we wanted access to the cartridges too, but then the proper thing to do then would have been to pass it in explicitly to the methods. As I said in the first video, when in doubt, explicitly parameterize. It's a rule that will spare you a lot of headaches. So that's it for all the types of the NES package, all of the emulator logic. Looking now at the UI package, which is everything concerning creating the window and managing the audio and all that. It's considerably simpler. These are all the types. We have first a director, which is just sort of an abstract composite of all the core things making up the game. You have first a window, which in this case is a GLFW window. We have a pointer to this audio thing, which is a struct with first a stream from the port audio library, and then also this channel. Because what happens is that the emulator, uh, the APU uh, spits out floats and sends them on this channel, which is then received in the UI package, which then copies them to the stream. The view here is an abstract notion of what is currently on screen. It's either the game view, the actual running emulation of some ROM, or it's the menu view, which in the emulator, if you hit escape, it shows you this menu that uh, gives you an icon for all of the uh, ROMs in your current working directory. So when you're looking at this menu, then the view field of the director is a menu view, but when you're actually playing a game, it's a game view. And then this menu view here is always a reference to the one menu view, because during the course of the game, if you reset the game or you load another ROM from the menu, it creates a new game view. So view is going to change over time, but there's always just one menu view. So that's just stored in this uh, field of the director. And then lastly, this timestamp field is just when we keep track of how much time has elapsed since the last frame, we store the old time in this timestamp field. It's actually a vestige of the object-oriented design, and I would have just gotten rid of it and used a simple local variable in a loop. Honestly, these other fields uh, probably could do the same thing, really. We don't really need a director struct, perhaps. All of these director fields could probably just be locals in the main function loop. But this is what he had in the original code, and it's not too offensive, so I just stuck with it. Now, this texture struct thing is perhaps a little bit misnamed. It's not just a general texture. It's a specific thing used by the menu view because the menu view has this, it presents this grid of icons representing all the ROMs in the current working director, as I mentioned. And this is what keeps track of all of those images, those thumbnails. And it's just these lookup tables where you look up by name of the ROM, you look up the OpenGL handle to an actual texture. So the name is kind of misleading, and, and honestly, everything to do with the menu view. When you hit escape and you see that list of ROMs, it's all really half-baked and there are bugs in it, which I didn't really bother to fix. It doesn't seem like a very useful feature either because you can just restart the emulator. So if, say, I was really taking over as maintainer of this project, I would probably just rip the whole thing out. Uh, but anyway, it's there in the code, so I wanted to just make sure this is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So we'll actually ignore the menu view in its code and just look at the game view, which is composed of a console pointer and the console object just represents the entirety of a new console. Every time you start a new game, or you reset it, or you select a new ROM from the menu, it just creates a whole new console object. And interestingly, that's actually the only allocation in the course of the running of the program. So even though this is written in Go and it's garbage collected, while you're just playing a game, there shouldn't be any garbage collection pauses because there's nothing to collect. It's, it's not producing new garbage in the normal course of just running a game. The title field, I think, is just what gets displayed in the, the window title bar. Um, and hash is used for, uh, there's a feature where you can generate screenshots and actually record GIFs. And there's also, uh, in the newer version, which I didn't base my code off of, there's a, a still experimental, I think, a save state feature. And so the hash is used in the, the save file names. That's why there's a record boolean. That's just a flag that gets set as you start recording and gets unset when you stop recording. And then this frames slice of images, that's where we just store the images as we play. And then when we stop recording, then all those frames are taken and generated into a GIF. Lastly, the texture field in the game view, that's just a handle to an OpenGL texture where we're rendering the actual game to. We're just taking the frame buffer and spitting it out to that OpenGL texture every frame. So those are all the types of the UI package. And again, the changes I made, well, I made the view interface a dummy interface, whereas before it had a few methods, whereas now I'm just using type switches to get all the same effect. The other thing I changed is that both the game view and the menu view had a pointer back to the director struct. So we had another scenario here of confusing recursion where the director contains the views, but then the views also point back to the director. And really the only reason for this is because it was just a matter of convenience of not having to pass in uh, the director to the methods of game view and the menu view explicitly. After inlining a whole bunch of the methods, that's now largely a moot issue, 
but in the few cases where it remains and we have separate functions, it still is just better to explicitly pass in these pointers rather than having this nonsensical data structure. So that's everything to do with the data types. And then lastly, the major thing I did with all of this code is I primarily inlined most of the functions, or methods I should say. In virtually every case where a method was called in just one place, I would just inline that code rather than have a whole separate function or method. The result is that in our UI package, we end up with one core function that's about 500 lines long. And then similarly in the NES package, we have another core function that's uh, about the same, 500, 600 lines long. Depends exactly how you count because in a few cases, well, I did, I did this. So here in the core function of UI, uh, it's called run. It's basically just the kickoff function. So main does a trivial amount of business just parsing um, command line arguments to get the, the paths of the ROM and then it invokes this run function. But see here at the top, I have essentially these, what I call sub functions. There's clamp scroll, set view, load texture, and play game. And these are all functions that are in here inside this run function because this is the only place where they're called. They're not used outside of run. And by creating them inside, then it's, that's explicitly clear. They, they can't possibly be used elsewhere unless of course they're passed out of the function, which they're not. Three of these are separate functions because they're used in more than one place within run. Uh, but then load texture actually, that's only invoked in one place, but it's involved enough that I decided it was too ugly to, to put in line. So I made it the separate function, except rather than having external to run by putting it inside run, and again, it's, it's clear that, hey, this is only used inside here, so you don't have to think about it elsewhere. Now, there is this sticking point with these sub functions being at the top of the function. I mean, that's the logical place to put them because you can't declare them after the body of the function because then they wouldn't be visible. Effectively, they're local variables that have to be declared before they're used. What I would really like is if Go or other languages had within a function, I could write a nested function. Let's just say it's a reserved word subfunc that declares a function that's local to this scope, but not really a variable. So for one thing, the, the variable would effectively be constant. You couldn't reassign these variables. That's probably not a big deal, but just for a little bit of extra assurance. But more importantly, I should be able to put these subfunc declarations at the end of the function. They should even be able to go after the last return. So just for stylistic purposes, you can have the actual proper start of the function, uh, which is this line port audio dot initialize. That should really be the first thing you see in the run function. You don't want to have to scroll past these hundreds of lines of code of these, uh, of these sub functions, right? So that right there alone would be a big stylistic win. But then also perhaps even more important, I really would prefer these sub functions to not see in closing scope at all. They should not have access to anything else in the, the run function. I don't want to rely accidentally on closure. Closure is occasionally useful, but if I don't really need it, it's something I prefer avoiding. Again, wherever possible, I want all my code to be explicitly parameterized. So anything that these sub functions see should be stuff that's passed into them explicitly, excluding, of course, actual global variables. So keep that idea in mind. If you look at this code and say, oh geez, that's really ugly having all those functions inside those other functions. I agree, yeah, it's, it's not ideal. I just wanna have these things which are local to this scope, but just like top level functions, I shouldn't have to care about their declaration order, which I think I do here in this case, actually. I think one of these functions is called by the other, so I had to order them properly so that uh, it's pre-declared and then visible in the other function. Like, I don't have to think about that stuff. I just wanna have them private to this local function, but not have to think about their declaration order or about closure or any of that stuff. So anyway, let's look at the actual run function here. The first thing effectively we do in the program is we initialize the port audio library. Uh, we create the audio struct object, which remember just had a channel, which we'll be using to pass the actual sound data from the, the console object from the APU back out here to the UI layer. Um, and then the other field of audio is the stream, to create the stream, we invoke port audio.openStream. And I don't know the details of the port audio library, but uh, basically I think what happens here is the port audio library, this, this function here you pass it, is being called every time it wants more uh, audio data. And so you can see that's coming from audio.channel, it's getting the actual data and it's writing the sample to this output buffer. So the slice of float32 is called out here. You just put data in there and that's what you'll hear come out your speakers. Notice that the function uses a select statement. So effectively, if there's nothing waiting in the audio.channel, if there's nothing to receive, then it just fills the, the buffer with zeros. So if our emulator can't keep up and supply audio data fast enough, then we're just gonna hear silence. And in any case, so we get back our stream and we handle errors and we assign the stream to audio.stream and we just make sure that we clean up by closing the stream at the end with a defer statement. 
Next, we initialize glfw, which is just a convenient, simple library for opening windows with OpenGL contexts, and it does also some basic keyboard and input handling and all that. It's not something you would really use for a professional grade project, but it's convenient for a simple little program like this. We then initialize this font mask variable, which we declared at the top of the run function. It's simply an image which contains the glyphs that are going to be used when drawing the menu. Basically, we just generate this image of character glyphs from this font data constant, which is declared in UI underscore types. I don't see any reason why we're generating a new image every time we run the program. We could just have it be a set ping in our project directory, but uh, this is what the original code did, so it didn't change it. Once we set up the font mask, we then create our actual window using glfw. Note that these window hint calls are telling glfw that we're using OpenGL version 2.1 which is a very old version of OpenGL, but it's perfectly suitable for our purposes. We then initialize OpenGL itself, and then we set up our director object in the curly braces here, which I added just to make it explicit that these local variables don't escape this context. Uh, we're just doing some OpenGL business of uh, binding the texture that we're gonna use to actually render. And notice at the end here, we're also setting up the so-called texture object, which is part of the menu view thing, which again, I said is kind of misleadingly named. Next, if our command line args, if the paths is just a length of one, then that is assumed to be just the name of an individual NES ROM file. And so we're gonna play a game and the play game function creates a console object and sets up a game view object. And, and then it itself actually calls the set view function, which actually sets up the view in the director object. And there's some setup business associated with it. So it's not a totally trivial function, but it's not very complicated. Otherwise, if the length of the paths is not one, then we're gonna start the emulator at the menu view. And for that, we've already created the menu view, so we just pass it to set view directly. At this point, the initial state of the program is ready to go, and we enter the main loop. Each time in the loop, we first just clear the window. Then we wanna determine how much time has elapsed since the previous frame, so we use this convenient function from glfw, get time. And we get the delta between the last timestamp and the new time. That gets us dt, which, after the first frame, it should be a very, very small value. This window is gonna be tied to your refresh rate. It uses VSync, so at 60 hertz, it's gonna be about um, 0 0.016, about 16 milliseconds or something like that. Then we have this check to make sure the director's view is not nil before we proceed. That actually, I, I think we don't need it. That's vestigial from the original code, and it was in there, I think, because well, this code was in a separate method, and so for, it was trying to account for the more general case of, well, hey, maybe that might be nil, but it's very clear now with all the code in line that it's never gonna be nil, so we don't actually need that. So the real next line is this type switch, and we're switching over the type of the director's view, which is either gonna be a pointer to game view or a pointer to menu view. And the game view is the one we really care about, that's when we're actually doing emulation. Inside this case, we first check if dt happens to be greater than one because maybe something happened in the system and there was a really long gap between the last frame. Or also on the first frame, this is gonna be a very large value because d.timestamp wasn't previously set. So I think it actually defaults to zero. In these special cases, we treat dt, the delta time as being equal to zero, which will mean that in our emulation, we don't actually do anything. We're not gonna advance the simulation any steps in this case. Next, we check if the player has hit escape or if they've hit um, a certain button on the, the, one of the two joysticks that uh, signals us to go to the menu view. And so we call set view and pass in the menu view. Next, we update the controllers. And once again, I've dropped into a pair of curly braces just so that all these declared local variables you don't have to think of outside of this little scope. And here we get keyboard and joystick input from these utility functions, read keys and read joystick, which themselves use glfw. This turbo variable will be true for three frames and it'll be false for the next three frames and it just goes back and forth every six frames. And that's just basically to simulate the effect of turbo buttons on certain NES controllers where you just hold it down and it automatically repeats. And once we read the input using these util functions, we then pass them on to the NES module uh, via these functions set buttons one and set buttons two. And then we call the core function of the NES module, which is called step seconds. And that's the other main function we'll walk through, but very briefly, it steps through however many simulated cycles of the NES hardware uh, given the amount of time. So, you know, the NES ran at a certain clock rate, so it figures out how many cycles of the CPU and so forth. After advancing the hardware simulation, we then actually render the frame using OpenGL. And I won't go through the details here because they're a little confusing, uh, but basically we need to figure out the dimensions and, and figure out how to represent in the OpenGL coordinate system for the window 
uh, how to draw the, the texture. And the texture is taken from the nes.buffer function. That you pass in the console and you get back the front side buffer, which is just an image. And then we use the, that set texture utility function will make sure that OpenGL actually draws that texture image. Everything in the curly braces here, that's where the actual drawing is done after computing what the dimensions should be in terms of the uh, OpenGL window coordinates. Last thing here, there's uh, if v.record, that is if the record flag is true, then we're going to want to append the current frame to the frames slice. And notice that we have to copy the image from the front buffer because the front buffer is going to be actually overridden in the next frame. So we would lose it if we just passed a reference to it. So we need an actual copy and that gets stored in v.frames. That's the whole case for pointer to game view, but then there's also pointer to menu view when we're looking at the menu. And I won't go into any details here. It's just basically figuring out how to draw this grid of icons and, and display. And also there's logic for you can use the cursor buttons or the, or the game pad to navigate among the icons and then select them. And it's actually, I should say buggy. If you try and run the program, you'll notice that if you hit up from the top line of this grid, you'll then crash the program. And I didn't bother to fix that. After the type switch of handling either the game view or the menu view, we then uh, invoke the, on the window, the GLFW window object, you invoke this swap buffers method, which swaps the front and backside buffers of our window program, not the front and backside buffers of the emulator of the emulated NES hardware, but the actual window. So this is what really displays the frame. And also by default, it's a vsynced. So it's also what's effectively regulating our time. It's why every time we go through this loop, DT is usually going to be 1 60th of a second. It's going to be about 16 milliseconds. After swapping buffers, we then pull the events. That's what actually reads the input from the operating system. You know, like Windows, say, sends messages to your program. That's what actually reads them. And then in the next iteration of the loop, when we call the util functions, which in turn call the GLFW functions that read the input, if we didn't call pull events, then our program would never process the messages. And GLFW would just say, hey, there's no input, even if there was. So that's why we call this function. And that's the very last thing in our loop. And then once we leave the loop, the last thing the program does in the run method is it sets the view to nil. This doesn't really do anything. It's just cleanup. I don't know if it's really truly necessary. You could probably leave that out and the program would terminate just fine. So that's all of run. And again, that's the core of the UI package. Looking now at the step seconds function, which is the core of the NES package. Uh, there's sort of a similar pattern here at the top. I have a, a number of private functions of sub functions, whatever you want to call them including trigger RQ, which is used in a couple places. And then actually step PPU and step APU are only called in one place, but they're complex enough. I thought they should be their own separate functions, except for the fact they are only called in this one function step seconds. So I just made them private to step seconds. We won't go through the details of those functions. So just looking here at the actual business of step seconds. First, we assign to cycles the CPU frequency, which is a constant. Uh, multiplied by the actual number of seconds that we're going to be stepping through in this interval for this frame. And then we're going to loop while cycles is greater than zero. So each time after executing the CPU instruction, we will decrement cycles by the number of cycles that one instruction took. And at some point, we're going to either hit zero or go below zero, and then we're going to break out of this loop. And so that's what the CPU cycles variable will be set to eventually. It's uh, we will assign it the number of CPU cycles for this one instruction in this iteration of the loop. First off, uh, we just assign CPU console.cpu just as a convenience, make it less verbose to access the CPU. If CPU stall is greater than zero, that's the number of cycles we want to stall for. So we decrement CPU stall by one, and then uh, CPU cycles for this iteration will just be one. So in some sense, it's like we executed a no-op instruction of one cycle, but there's no actual instruction we're consuming. So not exactly the same thing, but close. In any case, if we're not stalling, then we want to execute an actual instruction. But first, we need to check if there was an interrupt triggered. And if so, then we run the interrupt first. And there's two kind of interrupts. There's an IRQ and then a uh, NMI, non-masculine interrupt. Details of all that, I'm not clear on. Anyway, after the interrupt handling, we then execute an actual instruction. We read byte here, we'll read from the next program counter address. It'll get the actual instruction byte. The instructions in an NES are always a single byte. That gives us an op code, which we pass to execute instruction along with the console. And then execute instruction does all the business for that particular op code. That will update CPU.cycles. We subtract to get how many cycles that one instruction took. That accounts for simulating the CPU, and most of the core logic is in that execute instruction function. 
Then for the PPU, however many CPU cycles we executed, we then need to run through three times as many PPU cycles because the two run in sync, but the PPU actually runs at a three times faster clock rate. Unlike the CPU, the PPU isn't being fed instructions. The PPU just has its own internal state with registers and it looks at memory, but it's just a fixed function processor that every cycle it's doing the same logic, right? And all that core logic is in the step PPU function, which we call for however many CPU cycles times three we had. But then for certain ROMs, which use this particular mapper, the one we're calling mapper four, there's some extra logic that needs to be done. So that's why we have this type switch here. Come to think of it, I'm not really sure why this type switch is outside the step PPU function. It seems like it should just be the last thing done in that function. But anyway, here it is. Lastly, after handling the PPU, we then step the APU for however many CPU cycles we did because the APU, unlike the PPU, runs at the same clock rate as the CPU. In fact, I believe it actually is part of the same component. I think the APU and the CPU are actually really the same package or something. In any case, the step APU, like the PPU, doesn't really operate on instructions. It just every cycle does the same thing. It follows the same logic, rather. And whereas the PPU in our emulator is generating the back buffer and then swapping that with the front buffer every time it creates a new frame, the APU here is feeding that channel of float 32s that gets sent out to the port audio stream. And it just has to feed that data fast enough to make sure we have continuous sound. After the APU, very last thing in our loop, we just decrement cycles by however many CPU cycles we step through in this iteration. So I hope that gives you a basic foothold in understanding how this emulator works, and you could probably then delve into the details yourself. I think what you will find looking at the original version of the code and my version of the code is that my version is probably much easier to follow because it's not cut up into tiny little methods. So you coming fresh to this code base, trying to find your way around what is neatly sequential or, or at least a, a neat sequence of branching, that's all clearly put together in one place in code. You're not jumping all around and you're not trying to interpret these names and try and think of what they might mean, these function names or method names, what they might mean in some general case. I think that's part of the problem with atomizing your code into really small functions and methods. It's because generally when I look at a function, I'm trying to think of, well, there's, there's a function here. It must have some general case it's trying to account for. That's why it's its own separate function. But typically in object-oriented code and, and also even in some non-object-oriented code, people, when they atomize their code into really tiny functions and methods, they're thinking in overly general terms. Often in a way is actually really misleading. For example, in the original version of this code, there are a number of constructor functions that I got rid of because I just inlined them. And the, the problem with those constructor functions, in which in Go, they're not literally constructors, they're just regular functions that by convention say new x to create a new x object. But in any case, when you see such a function, you're thinking, well, so this must be something done in many different parts of code, and so it must be accounting for some general case of creating an x. But it turned out that actually, no, that function's only called in one place. And so the reason that constructor does what it does is because you have that one particular use case in mind. You're not really accounting for the general case at all. By creating a standalone function, you're actually misleading the reader into thinking that some general case has been accounted for, when in fact it hasn't. On top of that, you may often, I think, end up wasting your time because when you define a function, you feel that obligation to try and generalize the code. And so you'll, you'll waste time solving the general case of a problem that you don't even have. You just have the specific problem and if you don't unnecessarily split code off into separate functions, you'll much less likely waste time trying to generalize your solutions. So I do think that my procedural version of the code is considerably easier to read, but uh, keep in mind, part of the reason I chose this project is because the emulation logic, the NES package in particular, it's a good example of code, which if you don't understand the domain, you're not really gonna follow the code at all anyway. You're certainly not gonna understand the details. So I hope the contrast illustrates here that the atomization into small methods doesn't really buy anything in terms of comprehensibility because it's already incomprehensible to someone who doesn't understand NES hardware anyway. Yes, it is arranging the code into less intimidating bite-sized chunks, but because you don't understand the domain, you have no context for what those chunks really do. And so you're not really gonna understand anyway. You, you can understand the logic of, of simple short functions more easily, I suppose, but you're not gonna understand the whole any better. In fact, it may end up being more confusing and harder to grasp because everything is fractured. The UI package provides a different kind of contrast because that's a package that basically anyone should be able to understand it. It's not any domain specific stuff at all, really. It's 
just uh, creating a window using various libraries like GLFW and Port Audio and so forth. But I think even there too, you will find that the procedural version is particularly easier to understand because the core loop of the program is all there presented in more or less a, a straight sequence rather than being broken up. However, there are places where I've inlined the code and the result is sometimes perhaps a little more difficult to understand just because you have this long function that then naturally has a lot of local variables to look at and consider. And that is a legitimately a problem. That's probably the biggest drawback potentially to having longer functions is that over the course of a long function, you're accumulating typically more and more variables that you have to think about and that can get confusing. In fact, when I think about the complexity of a function, I don't really think so much in terms of so-called cyclomatic complexity of like how deeply you're nesting loops and branches and so forth. I mean, that, that is a concern. But for me, the real measure of complexity is, well, how many variables do I have to keep track of? Now, in most languages, including Go, within a function, you can have subscopes. And so the variables you declare there, you don't have to think about for the rest of the function. However, there's this problem in the other direction, where in the subscopes, I don't necessarily want to think about everything from the enclosing scopes. As I mentioned in the first video, it would be really great if we had some language construct which solved that problem, which allowed us to introduce what I call the use block, where you drop down to a subscope, but at the top in the header, you have to specify exactly what you're taking from the enclosing scope, and otherwise, you don't see anything from the enclosing scope. In fact, use blocks would be more like a one-time call subfunction, because the, the variables you bring from the enclosing scope would actually be copies, just as if we were like calling a function and passing in arguments. You know, the, the argument variables aren't the same as the parameter receiving variables, right? They're separate copies. So I want basically the same thing within my functions. So I hope you just keep in mind when looking at some of this code and you say, oh, gee, that one function looks really ugly. Use your imagination a little bit and, and imagine if we did have the subfunc feature I talked about earlier and, and this use block thing, imagine if you employed those, how the parts that seem hairy could potentially be a lot cleaner. Though even then, perhaps there are places in code where I went too far in inlining all the methods. I, I just wanted to take it to pretty much the, the logical extreme to demonstrate that what's supposed to be a horrible, horrible sin, according to many authorities, is actually really not all that scary at all. I mean, it can get a little problematic, but it's, it's in many ways much better than the atomizing everything to tiny methods approach. So you may choose in your code to dial back and split things more often to their own separate functions. And I probably would too a little bit. I hope what I've illustrated at the very least with this code is you should not be seeking to constantly separate stuff off into functions. You should only be separating stuff off into functions until you actually have a problem. You have a problem of, hey, this code is too complicated, or hey, I have this piece of code which gets repeated in multiple places, and so I definitely need a function.